think gone wrong? Metro police say on Friday night, two guys staged a fake robbery here to make a YouTube video, but not everyone was in on the joke. February 5th, 2021, an American YouTuber, Timothy Wilkes, staged a robbery prank for a YouTube video. However, his victims were more dangerous than he thought and what they did to him changed the course of his life forever. Here are five times YouTubers messed with the wrong gangs. Number 5. Zachary Stoner at 1.29 a.m. on May 30th, 2018, Stoner, known by his nickname Zach TV, was attending a rap concert at the Refuge nightclub in Chicago. He stepped out for a few minutes to grab something from his SUV, but right behind him was a black minivan filled with gang members. As he entered his SUV, the windows of that minivan came down and guns came out. The shooters fired many rounds at Stoner with one tearing through his shoulder and another lodging behind his ear and into his brain. Stoner, who tried driving off the moment he noticed he was being shot at, ended up crashing into a light pole. The drive-by attack on Stoner was due to his content as a YouTuber. Zach Stoner dedicated his life to documenting parts of Chicago that few outsiders with video cameras ever bothered to visit. He uploaded the interviews on YouTube as Zach TV, so it's safe to say he was a vlogger. He would do tremendous work capturing local artists in their element sometimes even before anyone outside Chicago knew who they were. Some rappers he captured that eventually went mainstream are Chief Keef, 600 Breezy, Queen Key, and FBG Duck. It's impossible to count how many lives he's touched with his work. However, his murder didn't just bring an end to his life, but also exposed the secret Chicago gangs that orchestrated his murder. Police would arrive at 1.35 a.m., the morning of the murder. They discovered Stoner alone, slumped in his car seat, they checked his pulse, confirming he was dead. Then another cop found his loaded 40 cal pistol at his feet. However, he hadn't fired a single shot. Despite the numerous cameras around the scene and the many suspects apprehended, no convictions were made. If you're asking why, well, the truth is that the Chicago Police Department actually solved the case years after the murder, but prosecutors declined to prosecute. So the alleged suspects were released. But before we get into those details, the first thing you need to know are the two gangs initially pinpointed as being responsible for Stoner's murder, the Goontown Gang and the Perry Avenue Gang. Both these factions are located on the south side and have been longtime foes. For years, they posted rap videos on social media taunting each other while attacking themselves on the streets. And since it's kind of known for young black men to be wrongly associated with the gang on their block, Stoner was assumed to be a member of Goontown given that he grew up in their territory. However, there's a whole lot more to this story. The police tagged the death as a clash between mutual combatants, which is a disputed legal concept that allows two or more groups to settle their differences in a gun battle. And yeah, stuff like that still exists. The cherry on top of this fact was two of the three suspects arrested died mysteriously, kinda like they were trying to cover it up. So with zero leads and insufficient evidence, the case was dropped, and keep in mind that Stoner had anticipated this attack. In one of his vids where he interviewed a gang, seemingly glorifying them, he revealed he knew rival gangs would target him. That left him with no option but to carry a gun for self-defense, and he didn't even get to use it. He had a friend named Thomas T. Streets Davis, who was in the car the night he was shot. And while Davis survived the attack by reportedly firing shots back at the attackers, he was assassinated a few hours before Stoner's funeral back in 2018. And just to silence the uproar that came with both murders, prosecutors claim they're leaving the door open to charges in both cases. But we highly doubt anyone will get charged for either murder. Number 4. Timothy Wilkes a man shot someone during what police are calling a fake robbery. They say it was all for a YouTube video. February 5th, 2021. 20-year-old Timothy was shot dead as he attempted a robbery prank on a group of men in Nashville, Tennessee. Prank videos have become a niche for content creators to attract followers from all over the globe. And judging from the number of internet sensations who still film and post these types of videos, it's safe to say the move actually works. Unfortunately, the internet has become saturated with obnoxious pranks. However, instead of searching for other ways to go viral, content creators have opted to dial up the stunts, making them more outrageous and dangerous, even for themselves. To be fair, sometimes it works. 
Other times it ends in disaster. Regrettably for Timothy Wilkes, his shot at fame threw a dangerous and not thought through prank ended with his death. 9.30 p.m. on the night of the incident. Timothy and his friend armed themselves with butcher knives to film prank robbery videos. They planned to record people's reactions to being held at knife point. Then they chose the urban air trampoline and Adventure Park parking lot as the scene for their fake crime. And once they got there, they spotted a group of men to kickstart that prank. With their knives, they approached the group in the parking lot. One of the guys here is 23-year-old David Starnes Jr., who had a gun on him. Starnes, who completely had no idea he was in a fake robbery prank video, felt threatened and retaliated by fatally shooting Timothy, killing him on the spot, and also enabling his friend to escape unharmed. By the time Tim's camera crew approached David and informed him that this was a prank, he stayed behind while his group fled in anticipation of the cops pulling up. A few minutes later, they did, meeting Starnes with a murder weapon and Timothy Wilkes being attended by emergency services. When interrogated by cops, Starnes told him the obvious truth, which was he acted in self-defense. He had no idea he was in a prank. I mean, how was he supposed to know? According to a lawyer speaking on his behalf, he said, I'm sure the people involved would like to characterize this as a prank, but it certainly seems to be a prank that went seriously awry. That alone was enough to dispute any potential charges that could have been filed against Starnes. Especially when looking into the fact that there have been numerous botched YouTube pranks similar to this in the past. One of the many examples was 2017. YouTuber Mona Lisa Perez, who fatally shot her boyfriend, Pedro Ruiz, in a failed stunt for YouTube. You see, the two believed that a thick book Pedro was holding would stop a fired bullet at close range. The pair had tested that theory, and it worked. However, during the actual filming, Perez stood further away, and Pedro held the sturdier book. She fired that fatal shot about a foot away from Ruiz. That bullet tore right through the book, penetrating his chest, killing him. Mona Lisa, then pregnant with the couple's second child, pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 180 days in jail and 10 years of probation. In 2020, a similar case occurred, when a group of teens decided to play a prank on one of their moms. Three of the young men wore ski masks, simulating a robbery by holding an airsoft gun against the woman's head. The woman's son, who was part of the prank, feigned fighting off the robbers while recording the scenario. However, what they didn't see coming was the 40-year-old woman managing to escape and run for her dear life. That prompted her son to contact the authorities, telling 911 that, I just pulled a fake robbery on my mom and she ran. I think she called the police. She's nowhere to be found. And as you might have expected, the woman's son, along with his two friends, all face charges. And we could just keep on going with these botched YouTube prank videos that they try to get famous off of. But just like in the case of Timothy Wilkes, it almost certainly ends with someone dying. And as far as investigations have gone, David Starnes Jr. hasn't been charged with any crime. On the contrary, Tim's friend was expected to face charges for that prank. Yet at the time of this video, he hasn't been identified or charged for any crime. Nevertheless, days after the fatal shooting, Timothy's grandmother, Shirley Berry, said she had no idea Timothy had launched a YouTube career. It all kind of seemed like a mystery, but what had happened had already happened, and there was no taking it back. She just hopes that people learn from this tragedy and become more aware of the potential pitfalls of trying to earn social media money. If your children are doing anything like this, please let this be a note to really check on what they're doing. There needs to be awareness now that this is very dangerous. Number 3. Tanner Cook April 2nd, 2023, Virginia. Cook was shot in a mall after attempting to play what he called a simple practical joke on a man who wasn't down for his shenanigans. Tanner Cook's a member of the classified goons, a group of pranksters racking up millions of views across TikTok and YouTube for typical silly infantile jokes. Now, one of the group's most watched videos features popular streamer Gideon in which he and one of the goons stroll through stores snitching on the camera person filming random people in a bombastic way to start drama. While this type of content is found amusing by a specific audience on YouTube, it certainly wasn't funny to 31-year-old Alan W. Coley. The nature of the prank involved Cook using Google Translate to play the phrase, I think you smell, to Coley, who was in the mall picking up a DoorDash order. Coley told him to leave him alone several times and even swatted the phone out of his face but Cook kept getting close to him. So, 
Coley drew out his gun and shot him in the abdomen. Immediately after the shooting, a shopper called the cops who arrived just three minutes later to arrest Coley. As for Cook, he was taken to the hospital and had to undergo immediate surgery. While he did survive the attack, more details about the incident unfolded, changing the entire narrative. An investigation by authorities claimed this incident wasn't Cook's first time seemingly harassing an individual for a prank. Cook's page contains clips of him acting as if he's vomiting on ride-sharing service drivers, making a fast food employee nervous by jumping behind the counter, and bothering people at stores. In one particular video, a man being pranked ran towards the camera aggressively. And in another, a store manager called the cops on Cook. Long story short, he's provoking people for dramatic reactions. Meanwhile, the report also said this wasn't Coley's first run-in with the law. In 2012, he was charged with assault and battery after reportedly punching his father twice in the temple over a trivial dispute. However, the case was dismissed in Loudoun Juvenile and settled out of court. So on one hand, there was Cook, who had been charged separately as the video showed he was actually following Coley around the mall. While on the other side, Coley was charged with aggravated malicious wounding, shooting in the commission of a felony and discharging a firearm within an occupied building. But a big twist to the story was that Coley was acquitted. During the trial, Coley claimed self-defense. His defense lawyer, Adam Pulliard, argued that Cook's behavior, designed to provoke reactions for a YouTube channel, was menacing. He also asserted that Cook's pranks were meant to confuse people into generating views and weren't concerned with scaring people. Prosecutor Eden Holmes argued that the shooting didn't meet the criteria for self-defense. She emphasized that this bizarre prank, though unusual, wasn't threatening. And according to the law it mandated, Kali should have reasonably restrained himself from using excessive force. For this, the jury initially struggled to reach a unanimous verdict. But ultimately, they found Coley not guilty of all charges, supporting his claim of self-defense. And today, he's a free man. Number 2. Super Chinello August 31st, 2022, Ruben Ortega, aka Super Chinello, was returning from an event with his wife and their son when a wave of violence erupted around their neighborhood. Ruben hurriedly got out of his car to open the gate to his house, but in the process was shot 10 times. Ortega was a passionate YouTuber, evident in his dedication to his craft. He embraced a significant aspect of Mexican culture from Tlayacapan in the state of Morelos, bringing awareness to his predominantly foreign audience about the dance and culture of his people. On some occasions, he would live stream events, wearing his traditional red mask and makeup to inject a sense of humor into his online character. He was loved so much by the locals, who saw him as a man happy to showcase their culture and heritage to the world. And although he wasn't all that famous, Super Chinello's death did send shockwaves around the world. On the night of the incident, Super Chinello died right in front of his home after taking multiple bullets to the body. His wife was seriously injured while their son was lucky enough to escape unscathed. The news of his death was made known on his Facebook page with a post that read, Unfortunately, everything's true. Our friend and colleague Ruben Ortega passed away. Thank you for showing your support. Now the big question is, why was he killed? Well, it's a very sad answer. Ruben was just another victim of circumstance in the continuous war between Mexican cartels, gangs, and other criminal organizations. Some say he had previously criticized corrupt politicians in some of his YouTube videos, and that might have been the motive for his murder. While we can't say for certain if that's true or not, Ruben's death made everyone have a sense of resentment against the Mexican government. This was a guy who had done no wrong, who was a father, a husband, and a friend to everyone in his community, who only wanted to bring out the heritage of his people, yet his own government couldn't protect him. Mexico had failed him, failed his family, and most importantly failed his little boy, who would grow up traumatized without his father. And if it's not clear yet, it became evident that any and everyone in Mexico was in harm's way. Ruben's killers remain out there, adding his name to the list of thousands more who have been killed innocently in the wave of violence plaguing this country as a whole. It's a very scary thing to comprehend, because his death sent a message that no matter how you choose to stay away from the violence of these syndicates, no one is safe. And number one. Leslie and Pamela Montenegro 
March 2015, Pamela Montenegro, aka Lana Palucas, disclosed incriminating details on her YouTube channel regarding the connections between elected government officials and the independent cartel of Acapulco. Tragically, they silenced her by brutally killing her in the worst way possible. Nana Palucas Leslie engaged her audience with videos ranging from politics and makeup tutorials to daily vlogs about her life. Her presence online took a unique twist when she adopted the persona of a lady donning this black afro wig, bold red lipstick, and oversized sunglasses. In a manner reminiscent of current TikTok trends, she would amusingly interact with people in supermarkets, asking them trivia questions to get their reactions. As time went on, her following expanded, prompting her to shift that content towards exposing corrupt officials within the Mexican government. Leslie didn't outrightly call out names. Instead, she skillfully conveyed her message through humor, though its impact remained unmistakable and stirred up considerable controversy. In these democratic communities, freedom of speech would carry no harm, right? Well, welcome to Mexico. The journey towards her tragic fate began when she started shedding light on the activities of the enigmatic independent cartel of Acapulco, one of Mexico's most secretive criminal organizations. Now, this specific cartel operated stealthily, often overlooked due to its clandestine nature. They've played a massive role in the hundreds of homicides carried out within the town of Acapulco and were one of the many smaller groups in the area. So returning to Leslie, her publicizing the cartel's actions exposed her to death threats. Banners accusing her of collaborating with rival cartels to unveil the independent cartel's secrets and deliver them to the Mexican government began appearing around her restaurants. In response, Leslie vehemently denied these allegations, asserting that her information stemmed from reliable sources and that she had no affiliations with any cartels. Despite these threats, she remained resolute, continuing to post and exposing the cartel's activities, which turned her into a genuine threat to their operations. February 5, 2018, two men entered her restaurant during her night shift, ordered some beers, and mercilessly took her out. She was hit with three shots to the upper body, ending her life on the spot. Fortunately, Mexican authorities managed to apprehend one of the individuals responsible for this, El Pipas. The subsequent trial, however, took a perplexing turn. The presiding judge inexplicably dismissed the charges against El Pipas, despite an abundance of undeniable evidence. This unsettling outcome starkly illustrates the deep-rooted corruption that Leslie had fought against. Cartels manipulate the judicial system, even influencing high-ranking government officials and mirroring instances like El Chapo's daring prison escapes. Leslie's demise inadvertently led foreign entities to investigate the Acapulco cartel's affairs, eventually revealing the city's perilous state. The town itself made the ranking for being the world's second most dangerous city. The U.S. had even issued a special travel ban to dissuade Americans from going there. Leslie's hope of exposing the city's problems to both the public and the Mexican government aimed for change, yet she tragically underestimated the extent of corruption.